If you or a family member have been hurt because of the careless actions of another person, call Walker Texas Lawyer. They'll work to get you the financial compensation and justice you deserve. They have 40 years of experience, and you don't pay unless you win. Call 713-881-9653 today for a consultation or go to walkertexaslawyer.com. Oh, Brian, what have you done now? Broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, and around the world, and around the world, TV host, best-selling author, and radio personality, Brad Gilmore, brings you a collection of conversations with stars from movies. Mark Wahlberg. Hey, how are you? The legendary Mr. Christopher Lloyd. Christopher, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Great introduction. <laughs> Television. Jimmy Fallon joins us this morning. Jimmy, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this, bud. Kelly Ripa. Brad, thank you for having me. Comedy. Jay Leno joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, Brad, what's going on? Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Good morning. Music. Lola Monroe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The legendary frontman of ACDC, Brian Johnson, joins us right now. Brian, how you doing? Good morning, Brad. What lucky to talk to me, funny lad. Grammy Award winner Maya joins us. How are you? And more. And more. This is, is the, the collection. collection. Now your host, host the, the boat, boat, Brad, Brad Gilmore. Gilmore. And we're so excited to have him on the line. We've been talking about the new memoir to the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It. Ed joins us right now. Good morning to you. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, Brad. So let's let's jump right in. What? First of all, the title is phenomenal, and I know there's a great anecdote about the title, and I'm going to get into it. But what's the feedback been like uh, since the release of the book? I know it came out on the 4th. What is the feedback that you've been getting from people? People have really liked it. Uh, lots of people, everybody I've given it to so far has really liked it. I feel very fortunate. And Publishers Weekly and Kirkus and other people who officially review books have given it very high marks. So I couldn't be happier. It started just as something I was going to write down for my kids and grandkids so they know some of these stories about, you know, their great grandparents. My grandparents came over in a boat. It started like that and kind of it became mission creep. So when, when was it throughout the process that you said, you know what, maybe I should share this more than just with my family? I had about 15 pages that I was taking as notes for this supposed ghostwriter that was going to come into my life somewhere in the future. A guy approached me, a wonderful guy, David Bigliano, you know, a literary agent, and asked me to consider doing something like this. And I said, oh, that's great. And I'm already taking notes with my daughter about different things the family has been through. So when I had 15 pages, I showed it to my friend Mark Bahani and a dear friend of mine, and he laughed in all the right places. I went, I'm going to keep doing this. And then the keyboard became like a Ouija board that actually worked. You know, it took me to places and directed me up to the attic in the basement of my life, and, and I found some things I hadn't thought about in a long time. It's interesting you say that. When I um I, I had the privilege of, of speaking with Kelly Ripa, who put out a memoir uh, uh, last year, and she said something similar to what you did. As she began to write, she felt this certain catharsis that was taking over when she was going through the journey of compiling these stories together. And it sounds like you experienced a similar emotion. Same thing. You open a door to a hallway of your life you haven't opened in a long time, and somehow the air pressure in the house blows open some other doors that you didn't know existed either. And you get to relive memories and consult with others that are still living, you know, to make sure you're remembering it right. Did I really smoke a joint with Charles Manson a year before the murders? The answer is yes, I did. Verified by my friend James Jeremiah, who's still alive. And, you know, all this stuff is just ways to quantify it and make sure you're remembering it right. I did all those because uh, I wanted it to be accurate, of course. Yeah, when, when you look at some of the names that you've spent time around, and, I mean, th th there's there's stories in the book about the Beatles, about Richard Pryor, about Jeff Goldblum, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, the list goes on and on. There was even a, a story that, that you had a run-in with Marlon Brando. Is that right? Yeah, he was a dear friend of mine. He, you know, had me up there many times, and I quickly learned why I got called up there so often. What he did not want to talk about, acting, writing, directing, you know, 
puppetry, dance, train seals, anything to do with show business. He didn't want to talk about. He didn't want to talk about, you know, bricklaying, drywall, electrical, plumbing, you know, solar panels, wind turbines, anything kind of normal construction materials or stuff. He, he liked to talk about that. It was very odd. But we became very good friends and uh, talked about a good many interesting things. Some of them are fairly humorous. It's just, I'm sure that you had, almost when you're putting it on paper and look back at it, a, a certain, I don't know if imposter syndrome is the right word, but but a certain perspective of like, wow, I've actually have a little, a very fortunate life. Not many people can say, Ed, I, I can guarantee you, anybody who's listening to this, anybody who's seen you promote this book anywhere, has seen you also in one of their favorite movies and television shows. I mean, you've had this kind of blessed career and a prolific career if I might say, um, that, that has to make you feel a certain way to know that your work has been seen pretty much by everybody. You got that right. I'm a very lucky man. I'm smart enough to know it, how, how very lucky I am. You know, I won the lottery and I didn't even buy a ticket. I got to be born Ed Begley's son, who was a famous actor, won an Academy Award and a Tony and was nominated for Emmys, a wonderful father and a wonderful actor. So that opened the doors to me doing all the acting work that I started doing at a fairly young age of 17. But Brad, I had it all wrong for years. I really didn't think I had to train. I didn't think I had to take classes. I'm convinced to this day, if my dad had been a plumber, I'd be fitting pipes now. I just wanted to do what my father did. But I didn't have any training when I first started to go out and try to get an actual job. So I didn't get any work. Finally, I took some classes and trained and I began to, began to work. And I've been working ever since 1967, believe it or not. Yeah, and it's just it's a it's been a prolific career in, in a lot of ways. I mean, you've you've been doing uh, name roles and 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 shows and movies that we've all heard of for decades now. Now, going back to your father, who who's an accomplished actor in his own right, uh, and forgive me if I have any of my information incorrect, but your dad actually didn't make it as an actor until he was in his 40s, if I have that right. And 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 my question to you about that, if I am accurate, is did his persistence uh, teach you something uh, at a young age to know, like, never give up on your on the goal? A hundred percent. You know, he had worked. He grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. He worked at the wire mold plant, a company in Hartford called Wire Mold. He worked there for years. You know, I thought, is that what actors do when they're trying to be actors? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what they do. They wait tables. They work in a factory. And he was in his 40s before he finally started to become a bit of a radio star uh, in New York, and then a stage star, won a Tony Award for Inherit the Wind with Paul Muni, and then a film star winning an Oscar with a film uh, called, uh, the film is called Sweet Bird of Youth with Paul Newman and Geraldine Page. So he started to make it in his 40s and really got very successful in his 60s and won an Oscar. And had many other fine triumphs as a, as a performer. It's an incredible, incredible story. Both you and your father have had these in, in, awesome careers. Now, to go to the book, I know you. I'm sure you've probably told the story several times, and, and I and I've heard you talk about the origins of the title. But this is one of the greatest titles for a book. I can. I mean, I'm, I'm being honest with you, Eddie. I can remember in recent memory to the t Temple of Tranquility and step on it. Would you mind sharing the origins of the title? Uh, with people because it comes from a real uh, a real line that somebody said. Yeah, so it's uh, there's a, a great actor named Dick Stahl, and he was in many films and TV shows. You can look him up on IMDb, Richard Stahl or Dick Stahl. But this is a line he did not utter on stage or before a camera. He, like me, was very uh, affected by the Maharishi the Maharishi in the '60s when the Beatles went to see a guy this guru named the Maharishi, everybody, including Dick Stahl and me, thought, well, I would like to meet somebody like that one day. Well, he couldn't get in with the Maharishi, but he found another, you know, guru that had a temple somewhere in Indonesia or something, somewhere far away, Borneo, I'm not sure where. And so, like me, a very type A personality, he planned a trip from, from Los Angeles to Hawaii, from there, another flight to the Philippines, and from there, a merchant marine vessel, he got a, a berth on to get further on his path. And then uh, another small boat, and then up a dock to this temple. 
but things went wrong as they often do in life. And he was late leaving from LAX, so he missed the flight from Hawaii. So then he missed the boat when he got to the Philippines, the merchant marine vessel. There wasn't another one for a week. Then it was monsoon season, and he had to wait for quite a while. And finally, he's so late, he runs up the dock to get into a taxi to go to where he's going. And he says to the driver, the Temple of Tranquility, and step on it. And the driver started to laugh, and he started to laugh because he realized how absurd that was. You can't wreck serenity. You must let it happen. And I tried to do that in my book and in my life. And most importantly, you can't try to find serenity in in a bottle of vodka, which is what I made the mistake of doing as well. To the Temple of Tranquility and Step On It, Ed Begley Jr. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I want to also make note that uh, Ed's book is printed on 100% recycled paper, and he's going to be traveling carbon neutral to all of his events and media appearances. I think that's a very important thing to make mention of. Ed, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Brad, thank you for having me, my friend. Have a great one. Hurry up, tape running out.